We're visiting this beautiful cottage in the Hamptons to pick up on some ideas on how to push the home out into the garden. We'll take a tour right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. This is a show about creating beautiful outdoor living spaces and blurring the boundaries between inside and out. Now in today's show, we've got a real treat for you. We're visiting this beautiful cottage in the Hamptons. Now, I should say revisiting because you see, I was here back in the spring and into the summer because we completely transformed this landscape from a vacant lot to what you'll see here. Now, not only will we take a look at the garden, we're gonna to tour the inside of this house. You see, it was designed by a friend of mine, interior designer, Stephen Gambrell. Now, what I'm interested in seeing is how my garden has held up since the summer. Here we are on a beautiful but blustery fall day. Now, you think about a cottage as being typically a small house. I don't think that's always the case. I think it's more about the spirit of the place or the feeling that you get when you're there. To me, this idea of cottage is about expressing warmth and comfort and charm. We've all seen houses that exude these qualities. Of course, this applies both to the outside and the inside. And we'll be focusing on some of those elements of style that give a cottage that warm, cozy feeling. Let's start inside. Well, here we are in the main living space of this house. And it's one of my favorite rooms because it spills out onto the back garden. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Now, what I wanna say about this house is that it started out as an idea house for Cottage Living Magazine. You see, they got together an architect, an interior designer, and an exterior designer. They got us all together to create a cottage where the house and the garden work together with lots of interesting spaces. Now, one of the most enjoyable aspects of this was to work with Stephen Gambrell because he has a great sense of color. Take this room, for instance. I'm crazy about the wall color. It's a soft, steely sort of blue, and it feels expansive. Now, if he'd chosen a really dark color like a chocolate brown or even a dark red, this room would feel much smaller. Now, I use the same principles out in the garden. If I want a tiny garden to feel larger, then I use soft pastel colors. Blues are particularly good. If I filled a small garden space with lots of red flowers, it would feel really tiny. Now, the other thing to keep in mind here is that if you look around the room, you can see that there are color echoes going on. The wall color, again, is that sort of gray-blue. You see it in the fabrics. You see it in the furniture. You see it in the rug. He also used an accent color that would be orange and dark red along with chocolate brown. These are used sparingly, but they give the room a little spark. You know, I think there are a lot of lessons we can learn about the garden from a well-designed room like this. We've just talked about color, but some other principles of design that I employ include things like focal point. Now just think about it. When you walk into a room, there's usually a dominant feature that captures your eye. For instance, here, it's this fireplace with the three fish above it. In the garden, focal points play a similar role. You walk into a space, you immediately see something that captures your eye. Let me give you an example that we used here. Another one of my favorite rooms is the master bedroom. And what I wanted to do was create an echo, a color echo from the master bedroom garden into the room itself. And so in this garden space that looks out a bay window, I used a lot of silvery gray foliage plants such as Artemisia and Dusty Miller. This reflected the silvery gray color that Stephen used on the walls. Now back to focal point. At the far end of that garden, I placed a water feature. There, we colored it a sort of caramel brown to reflect or echo some of the colors that Stephen used as accents. Now, another place where we took from the inside and carried it outdoors would be right here in this room, the floor cloth or the rug. Here, you see a geometric pattern, and I wanted to reflect that in the little vegetable garden. There in this long space, we created a series of geometric shapes in raised beds for growing all kinds of things for the kitchen. 
fresh basil in the summer, along with lots of other herbs, as well as tomatoes and peppers. Now we're getting very specific about certain ideas. What I'd like to do is back away and look at the overall goal again. What we were trying to do is create a series of garden rooms that responded to the rooms of the home. And the way we did this was we worked out of windows and doors that would carry you, maybe not physically, but visually, out into the garden. Just take a look at the space you can create by opening these doors and windows out onto this porch. It's really wonderful, and what a generous space. Porches are a great transition space from inside to outside, and here we flow from the room across the porch right out into the garden. Now, if you get right down to it, this porch is another room, another room of the house, just an extension. Just like the living room we were in, you can find the same furnishings out here tables and chairs and sofas. You can even find floor lamps and rugs. And there's no comfort lost here. While you can sit out here and read a magazine, have a glass of wine, have your morning coffee, and these cushions, well, I mean, they're so comfortable. And all of these fabrics, well, they'll exist outside and they will not fade. They can get wet and there's no problem. In fact, we use the same fabric out in the garden to give our garden pavilions a little pizzazz. And I'll show you that in just a few minutes. But isn't this great looking? No style lost out here. Now once you step off the porch, you've got some choices to make. You see back here, there are seven garden rooms or spaces. Take the pool area. You could go for a swim. Maybe you're not into swimming. You could step over here and play a game of croquet on this nice level lawn. Or you might want to just take a walk under the shade of this arbor. Now technically, I suppose this would be called a pergola in that it is a classical structure. As you can see, it's supported by classical columns, and it has a shade timbered roof across the top. The idea is to grow vines on it. Here we have wisteria, and rather than being supported by classical columns, we have these trellis-like columns that create a wonderful rhythm all along the length of it. Now the idea for these columns actually came from the house. You see, I love to take an architectural detail and bring it out into the garden. And applying it to these structures, well, it's the perfect fit. You see, by doing this, by bringing a bit of the architecture into the garden, you create a more harmonious landscape. Now, for summer, we decked out the pergola with this wonderful weather-resistant fabric. Again, another element that we've threaded through the entire project. And of course, now at the end of the season, it's time to take these down, but they were very festive. One other thing that we did that really enlivened this walk is that we used some lanterns that we hung between the columns. That little spark of candlelight really set it off. Now, here's one of my favorite spaces in the entire garden. It's yet another garden room within this garden. This is the kitchen garden. Now, we took this long space and divided it into two areas on each side of this little chicken house. And then on each side, these geometric beds, the pattern that we saw inside, is laid out with these raised beds. Now, each one of these beds is made with a two by 12 inch board. And I used real cedar, western red cedar, because it holds up so well over the years. Now, in these raised beds, we filled it with a variety of plants. We used a lot of easy to grow edibles, such as eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, basil, thyme, and rosemary. Now in terms of the color for this space, I wanted to go for a gold and silver theme. So I used silver leaf plants, such as sage, lavender, artemisia, and lamb's ear. For gold, we used flowering plants, marigolds, melipodium, and a little wild zinnia. Now this little garden space is separated from the croquet lawn by this four foot evergreen hedge. Of course, the dominant feature in this garden is this dining pavilion. It's on the opposite end of the swimming pool, and there there's a dining table, side tables, and lots of accessories to make it feel like a room. Now in this space, which is on axis with the main master bedroom, we have a double perennial and annual border. I chose the foliage and bloom colors in this garden to reflect the choices Stephen made in the master bedroom. And on axis, you can see our water feature at the back of the garden. Now, if you follow this around, it'll carry us around to the front. Now we've come full circle. We're back around here in the front. Now, I divided this front space into three distinct areas. One, the small garden over here to the side. 
the second, the parking court, and the third, the area around the front of the house itself. Now for this tiny garden, I wanted to create a little hideaway, a garden that you couldn't see when you drove in, but you could appreciate if you came down this walk through the gate or if you look through the upstairs windows. And that's what we've created. I use the principal enclosure. Now on axis with the gravel path that takes you through this break in the stone wall is a focal point. Here we just use a rustic bird bath that we filled with sedums to capture your eye and draw you into this garden. Now, as you might suspect, this space has its own color theme as well. Here, I used white and chartreuse, two of my favorite colors, and it works very well with the gray gravel path. Now, for chartreuse, we used some beautiful ornamental grasses as well as hosta. For white, well, we used white azaleas and white impatience as annual color. Okay, now let's focus on the parking court. Now, when you're designing a garden, not only does it have to be beautiful, but you want it to be functional. So we wanted to make sure we had plenty of room for cars to pull in and park and turn around. Some of the elements that we use to define the space include this traditional dry stack wall, Belgian block borders all the way around, and the surface itself is asphalt covered with a granite chip. We created a cobblestone apron that brings you into this space. Now, if you'll notice, all of these materials are in the gray family, various shades, and they work beautifully with the color of the house. Now, we focused on hardscape materials. Let's talk about plants for just a minute in the parking area. Here, we wanted to screen out some views. On one side, we use the traditional privet hedge that you see so much throughout the Hamptons. On the other side, we used native eastern red cedar. And to create rhythm, we used arborvita planted in a row and to punctuate one side, we've accented it with a beautiful birdhouse. Okay, now it's time to talk about the third component of the front, and that's the front of the house itself. Now, what I did here is created a little tiny garden that's the length of this section of the house by about 10 feet, plus the bed that would take you from the walk over to the house. Now, what this space creates is a, is a foyer, if you will, or a prelude before you go into the house, and it separates the cottage itself from the parking court. Now, it's defined by this long bit of dry stacked stone wall, a boxwood border with rhythmically placed boxwoods across the front, punctuated in the center by a charming gate. Now, rather than plant a whole row of boxwood to create a hedge, which would certainly create a sense of enclosure for this area, I decided to space them apart where the enclosure is implied. And by spacing them, I think the rhythm is actually more interesting to look at. Right around the gate and some of the boxwoods, I planted lavender because the fragrance is so wonderful. Which reminds me, I think fragrance is one of the signature elements of cottage style. In fact, when we planted these front beds back in the spring, we filled them with all kinds of plants that gave off a great fragrance, such as the Casablanca lily, Nicotiana, and roses. As far as the plantings around this cottage, I think these on each side of the front door probably represented cottage style more than any, not only because of their fragrance, because of the shape and form of the plants. We wanted it a very loose and natural feel. That's why I like to mix the shrubs with the perennials and the annuals. The color theme was largely white with a touch of pink and lots of gray. In fact, the border plantings were done in lamb's ear and artemisia. Now, another signature element of cottage style is the abundant use of containers. And here we've done this at the entryway. We've used a variety of plants, herbs, shrubs, annuals, you name it, we've used it. And I've used two types of containers. The color theme is chocolate brown and pale blue. Look at these two toned ones. I just love them. They're called fondue pots. Now I think this collection of containers really helps accent this entryway beautifully. Now I love to grow things up and over. And what we've done here is use these column-like trellises that support the pediment over the door as a way to grow vines on them. You could do wisteria, certainly climbing roses come to mind, which would be beautiful and fragrant. There's no question that throughout time, roses have captured the imagination of everyone from curious little children to the most revered artist. 
Shakespeare, in fact, in Romeo and Juliet, immortalized the rose with his quote, what is in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. Well, I certainly think that Shakespeare was onto something. I mean, no matter what you call these beauties, their fragrance is the essence of something elegant and charming. Maybe that's one of the reasons I use them with such abandon in the garden homes I design. You see, in spite of their reputation for being fussy, many roses are actually easy to grow, especially the old garden varieties, which consequently are hard to beat when it comes to fragrance. Ease of care is one of the reasons I prefer to use antique roses, such as the Fairy, Russell's Cottage, and Old Blush. You see, the growing season is the busiest time of the year for me, and there are more occasions that I would like to admit when my roses have suffered from neglect but I can always count on these heritage varieties to fend for themselves until I have a spare moment to administer a little TLC. After all, many old-fashioned roses can be found thriving in long-forgotten cemeteries and abandoned homesteads, so you can't get much more carefree than that. Of course, a little maintenance goes a long way. The more you dote on your roses, the more vigor and blooms you'll see. And the routine is really fairly simple. All it takes is consistent moisture, monthly feeding and deadheading, and spraying for diseases when needed. And you'll see that the beauty of a well-tended rose will convert even the most lackadaisical gardener into a rosarian in no time. Now, when it comes to blurring the lines between inside and out, a rose is an ideal flower to have on hand. You see, you can cut them and bring them indoors for splendid bouquets, or you can dry them and make potpourri. In fact, during a visit to a leading potpourri producer in this country, I saw how they freeze and dry roses by the thousands. One of the processes that Aromatech uses is called the freeze-dry process. It's a very um, sophisticated process. We have freeze-dried not only the flowers, but we freeze-dry vegetables, uh, lemon and lime slices. The way this happens, you take a rose, in which we do thousands and thousands of every year, the rose is opened up in buckets of water to a, the, the desired width. Then you, the stem is cut, placed on trays that go in the freeze-dry machine. In the machine, the temperature is gradually lowered, and it takes about 10 days to process this whole thing. And, and as it, the temperature goes down, it is extracting the moisture from the flower, and gradually, it's a very gradual process, and when it's finished, the flower looks like it's just been picked, but yet it has a uh, lifespan that's probably four or five months. It's somewhere between a real flower and a silk flower, somewhere in between. Uh, it won't last forever, but it will, if you don't put it in direct sunlight, it can last six, six to eight months, and we use it extensively for our roses. As I mentioned earlier in the show, it's important in a cottage garden to create garden rooms or enclosures by using elements such as dry stack stone walls. You see, these are traditional time-honored signatures of this area. Now another signature would have to be the privet hedges. They're used everywhere here to create privacy and enclosure. Barry Block, a local landscaper, describes how these hedges are used. The privet we use in the Hamptons is the Ligustrum ovifolium. It's ready available. It's a deciduous plant, but here on Long Island, it maintains its leaves very late in the season. We consider it a semi-evergreen for that. It's basically a naturalizing plant because it looks natural in the landscape. Ligustrum ovifolium basically comes from a rootstock and cuttings is how it's typically grown. This privet isn't in invasive. Basically, the, it's produced by cuttings in production and it doesn't self-seed. It comes from rootstock from these cuttings and it's productionally grown in nurseries and farm fields and harvested either bare root or B&B &B. and we bring it out to the field, we plant it on and basically we maintain it by pruning and a light fertilizing application early spring. We prune the privet roughly two to three times a year depending upon the cultural situation it's in. If it's in full sun it's going to require more pruning, it'll grow faster. In shade the, pr the privet would only need maybe two times a year at max. Some of the taller privet requires us to get up on a scaffolding, a baker system, that's going to put a man of about five feet, six feet tall, up at least eight feet. And we take trimmers, gas power trimmers, and even extension poles with trimmers on them to reach above and also at the top of the privet, because we want to stop the top growth and push out the sides. 
we fertilize in the spring uh, before the plants emerge with their leaves uh, for good flush of growth. Privet's almost like a weed. Once it's established, it's going to keep growing. It's really a self-reliant plant. We plant the hedges typically one foot on center, sometimes 18 inches on center, depending upon the amount of impact and screening we want from the privet. Typically, we start from two to three feet in height, and we average about five to six feet is our tallest privet we plant. Anything taller becomes larger and wider, and they become more of a specimen plant. Uh, typical nursery production for the privet is roughly uh, as, as high as it is, is as wide as it gets for production purposes. So a two to three foot is really still going to stay kind of narrow, roughly around two feet wide. Or anything wider, you're shearing. The privet's mostly used for privacy. It's great as a backdrop on the larger states, such as this. It grows in excess of 8, and 10, and 12 feet tall. And it's really a living fence. And it allows a green backdrop to an entrance of a yard, an entrance of a driveway like this. At the Idea House, we use privet. We use privet 4 to 5 feet tall and 6 to 7 feet tall. In the backdrop where we needed more screening from the neighbors, from some unwanted views, we used taller privet. And on the side, where we wanted the vista beyond, we kept them shorter. It's, so, it's, so, it's used so often, and you see it all over. People often say to me, Barry, what's that plant growing everywhere? It's privet. It's got to be. Now, the classic signatures of the area don't stop here. Mark Hirsch describes the traditional use of painted wood fences and gates as a way to define and create enclosure. I think the Hamptons uh, theme is screening and privacy. The scale of the house generally doesn't matter, uh, whether it's a charming cottage or a stately manor. I would say traveling through the different towns of the Hamptons, um, using Sag Harbor as an example, uh, an old whaling town, they use a spindle picket uh, quite often. Whereas in Southampton or East Hampton as well, uh, the overriding theme is certainly a screening, a solid board fence. White is definitely the color of choice. There are so many cedar shake homes with white trim, so for continuity, we'll, we'll use white. The Hamptons evokes a, a sense of calm, uh, a sedateness, and the white works well with the sculptured privets. We will build a fence and gate um, to more than screen, but to evoke uh, a certain drama about what is beyond that gate, what is in the back. Certainly we'll create uh, property delineation, but beyond that we will build um, fences on the interior of a garden to create space and to enhance uh, whatever uh, garden theme is prevalent. We own and operate three mills uh, in Maine and we're able to harvest uh, northern white cedar and we only use the heartwood of the tree, uh, which is the most decay resistant. The key element to the longevity of a fence is the posts. And one of the things Walpole has and offers is what we call a lifeguard. And that is a PVC sleeve that fits in the ground. And the post sits on top. So there is no wicking, what we call wicking, which is the water absorption. So two things uh, lend itself to the deterioration to the post. That is termites, which will eat the wood, as well as wicking, which is the water absorption. So with those two elements resolved, the posts certainly last a lot longer. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed the tour of the garden and the interior as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith.